Want to know why? Ask how. Howard the Humongous. Thanks to cell phone video. We all saw something on Tuesday, May 26th that shocked and angered even rigidly self-controlled people like me. In front of our very eyes, a white policeman in Minneapolis murdered a man who had been zip-tied and was peaceful. I don't know about you, but every time I watch the video of this killing, I shout out loud at the television screen for the smug policeman crushing another human's neck to stop. The result of the videos airing on TV was a national outbreak of what may be the biggest wave of demonstrations in American history. Protests broke out in 140 American cities and towns, then spread overseas to England, France, Germany, Italy, Denmark, Brazil, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Poland. At this moment, it appears that these protests will last a minimum of 13 days. But there were two events taking place simultaneously over the first days of the demonstrations. One was peaceful protests, and number two was organized violence. The window breakers and building burners used the peaceful protesters as a cover for their own agenda. But who were the arsonists and vandals? The people with billiard balls and socks walking methodically from block to block, breaking every store window they passed. For 40 years, the far-right white supremacist groups have wanted a race war, a second civil war, at the end of which they are sure they will end up with an ethnically cleansed all-white America. On the other side of the political spectrum are far-left Antifa and anarchist groups, some of whom want a violent revolution to wipe out capitalism and to install their vision of a just society. The president would prefer to overlook the white supremacist groups and to blame Antifa only. In fact, he has announced that he will designate Antifa as a terrorist group. That approach strengthens a claim he is making as part of his campaign for the presidential elections, the claim that all Democrats are crazed extremists ready to tear America apart at the seams. And Attorney General William Barr, who has written that he is merely the president's hyper-obedient arm, says the Justice Department is investigating what it calls the Antifa, quote, command and control, close quote, of the protest violence. Why isn't there a similar focus on white supremacist groups? The president appears to regard armed groups on the right as his core supporters, and even as his potential stormtroopers, his potential bully boys. So there is a problem. No one is looking into the vicious involvement of the white supremacists. No one is investigating the neo-Nazis, the Aryan prison gangs, the skinheads, and groups like Aryan Nations, the American Freedom Party, the Assembly of Christian Soldiers, the National Association for the Advancement of White People, Christian Identity, and the Patriot Front. No one is highlighting the fact that America now has 900 hate groups. And that is a danger. The right-wing militia groups are heavily armed. They are chaos makers. And they are proven sources of mass murder. Remember what one of the members of the far-right militia movement, Timothy McVeigh, did in 1995. He destroyed the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Office Building in Oklahoma City and killed 168 people. Remember what another white supremacist, Dylan Roof, did in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015. He walked into a prayer group in one of America's most prominent black churches, was welcomed warmly, then killed nine of the people who had welcomed him. And remember what Robert Gregory Bowers did in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He walked into the Tree of Life Synagogue in the Squirrel Hill neighborhood and killed 11 Jewish congregants and wounded six more. These are things of a sort that no Antifa member has ever attempted. Let's go back to the president's determination to label Antifa a terrorist group and to ignore the violence of the white supremacists. Is Antifa really to blame for the window breaking and fires that marred the first days of the George Floyd protests? A study by the University of Maryland shows that 88% of domestic terrorist acts are done by far-right movements. 
not by extremists from the left. What's more, a Business Insider headline reports that the FBI has no intelligence indicating Antifa was linked to the George Floyd violence. And CNN reports that white supremacists have posed as Antifa online and have called in the name of Antifa for violence. There is also a suspicion that white supremacist groups have hacked into police radio and have given shoot-to-kill orders. The goal is to turn peaceful protests violent and get the civil war the far right has been waiting for. But despite an unpassed bill from Army veteran and Staten Island Congressman Max Rose, no one is investigating the involvement of the white supremacists. And that is a danger. Meanwhile, what did the protests accomplish? The protests hurried the arrest of the murderer, police officer Derek Chauvin, and of his three accomplices. The policemen who stood around him stood on George Floyd's legs and helped him and protected him while he slowly and deliberately killed George Floyd. The protests spotlighted the urgency of ending the police habit of killing men for the crime of walking or driving while black. The protests made the phrase systemic change part of the common vocabulary. The protests motivated the city council of Minneapolis to outlaw chokeholds and to consider disbanding its police department and starting fresh with a community-oriented nonviolent public safety and outreach capacity. The protests motivated Barack Obama, one of America's three most popular presidents of the last 70 years, to call on the mayor of every town and city to push for police reform. The protests motivated former President Jimmy Carter to announce that, as a white male of the South, I know all too well the impact of segregation and injustice to African Americans. We need a government as good as its people, and we are better than this. The protests motivated former Secretary of Defense, General James Mad Dog Mattis, to warn that designating American streets as battle spaces is against the Constitution. The protests motivated other military figures, like retired General Carter Ham, retired General John Allen, and even former Trump Chief of Staff retired General John Kelly, to support Mattis's denunciation of Donald Trump. And the protests motivated former President George W. Bush to say, quote, this is not the time for us to lecture. It is the time for us to listen. It is time for America to examine our tragic failures, and as we do, we'll also see some of our redeeming strengths. Just one more thing, then I will leave you alone. In many cases, a huge percentage of the protesters were white. And in Atlanta, Denver, New York, LA, St. Paul, Minnesota, and Bristol, Connecticut, police chiefs, police officers, and sheriffs went down on one knee and hugged or joined the protesters. This elevated the level of something that many hoped for in 2008 when Barack Obama was elected president, but that we have never achieved. The protest revived the hope for post-racialism. But the death of George Floyd and of all those unarmed black men who preceded him made it clear that we are a long, long way from that post-racial dream. This is Howard the Humongous speaking to you from the future. It is your job and my job to make. Or want to know why? Ask how. And now for that infamous sleazy slimy, sneaky, little off button. I think I've got it.